Okay, there we go. So the this meeting is being recorded, everyone. So Jackie, uh, welcome. Teresa, welcome. And uh, and I think uh, is Annette on. Uh, she is uh, also on the committee. So um, so I'll turn it over to you guys. Okay. Good evening and good morning, everybody. And thank you for joining this meeting. Uh, Teresa and I are so happy to see all of you. Some of you established Breed Council secretaries for many, many years and some brand new to the job. And we're excited with our year coming forward and being able to work with you. Today, we have a, um, a relatively short agenda because this is your meeting. So the biggest item is going to be you and, and hearing your voices. But as, as Daryl said, uh, one of the first items on the agenda is we were very excited, both Teresa and I, from those Breed Council secretaries who spoke yesterday about your enthusiasm of our project to work on the editing of the standards, whether or not we supported it as a constitutional amendment, all of the Breed Council secretaries who spoke seemed to appreciate the project. And so to reiterate what it was for those who were not at the meeting yesterday, we've discussed this on our list several times. This is the project to do type and copy editing of the standards, simply to be working on capitalization, spelling, grammatical errors, things like that, nothing about substance. And because it is, as always, the read committee's responsibilities and honor to be the standard of their, the, the keepers of their standard. Teresa and I would like to ask for 10 standards, eight to 10, but 10, 10 would be our preference, Breed Council secretaries who would like to volunteer for wave one of this project. Yes, Cindy? I'm sorry, I, th I, I thought Cindy said something. I may have missed it. Um, so, if we could get, as I mentioned, um, 10 volunteers, if we get more than 10 volunteers, that's great. We'll make that the second wave, assuming the board will allow us to do out of cycle ballots and we'll work, work our way through. Uh, again, the idea, Persians have volunteered already. We are very excited that one of our biggest breeds is gonna be our standard bearer of this project. And we're looking forward to everybody's help on this project. So um, to start with, do we have, any comments? I'm seeing some comments come up on this. Do we do we have any any comments on this from the Breed Council secretaries? Well, Cindy Bird, you're recognized. You're muted, Cindy. It's not working there. British Short Hairs would like to volunteer. Thank you so much. This is great. great. Marilee Griswold. The Scottish Folds will volunteer. Thank you, Iris. You're muted. Segarians will volunteer. Cassie, Carol Johnson. American Shorthairs will volunteer, but I'd also like to take ours a little bit as uh, another step forward. And that one of the problems in our standard is that we have a number of different ways within the standard that to describe the same thing. For example, in some places in our standard, um, cameos are um, de described as, cameo and whites are described as cameo and white with capital letters, with small letters, with an ampersand instead of the and. And I would like to see if I could get a general guidance as to what the preference would be from CFA, because I'd like to standardize that within our things like that within our um, standard at the same time we're doing the capitalization type of thing and just make one particular thing. I think Eileen originally had said, asked me, uh, about um, maybe uh, doing it a particular way. But if there's something that we want to do in there as a, as a group or as, as a general uh, breed council thing, I'd like to, to take it a step further. Uh, 
Jackie, why don't you go ahead and you can call on the people. Can you see their hands up? I can't see the hands up, no. Okay, um, well then I'll, I'll recognize the people then if that's okay. Okay, can, uh, I, can I respond to Carol on that one? Sure. Yeah, go ahead. So Carol, I would like um, Teresa Kiger, um, who of course is a very strong professional author and editor, is developing the style guide and we are working on that as a committee. So what you were talking about is exactly what we're talking about working with on that standard. Okay. Thank you. I, I, as soon as you get that, I would like to go ahead and, and see if I can get a group within my breed council to start working on this. I greatly appreciate you guys taking this on though. Thank you, Laura Gregory. Um, yes, the ragamuffins would like to volunteer. Um, we've already, we started on some of that last year, but we we didn't do the capitalizations. We've already begun and working on that again this year. And I agree with Carol. We would like to get the, the standardization for, we have the same thing with the cameo. We actually mentioned cameo in one place, chinchilla in another and so on. So we're trying to standardize even our verbiage within the standard. And also same thing, when do we say and, when do we use, you know, and so on. So if we could get a heads up also, we would like to standardize that too. Okay. Thank you. Charlie Monroe. You're muted, Charlie. Am I unmuted now? Okay. Somalis would like to volunteer. Okay, thank you. Bethany Kalila. Maine Coons are willing to volunteer. Thank you. Uh, Stephanie Moore uh, did a chat and she said that the uh, Vermellas would volunteer, Jackie. This is, this is amazing. We are so thankful to y'all. Um, Teresa, do you want to comment on the style guide and uh, the yeah, timeline? Yes, <laughs> yeah, I would. That's actually why I had my, my hand up. So, uh, uh, Teresa, doing? Teresa, hang on a minute. Sorry. Uh, if you're not speaking, please mute your microphone so we don't get all the uh, back uh, stuff. And once you're finished speaking, uh, please lower your hand. So I have already started um, the guide, just some, some basic um, items in regards to exactly what y'all have been talking about. Uh, in addition to that, uh, in answer to what both Carol and Laura mentioned, the committee uh, has on, um, on board a project to kind of help really with the intent to help new breeds who are coming in to see what preferred terms within CFA are so that they're not trying to reinvent the wheel and trying to come uh, use standard terms that we already have. So that directly, both of those directly fall under what we're talking about. And as soon as the committee signs off on those, and it won't be too long, I'll share them with everybody and that way all breeds can start thinking about, this is what we're going to do. Um, the other thing that we, we can do this one of two ways, depending on how you as breed council secretaries wanna do this. We can give you the guidelines and let you make first pass according to that. Or we can make first pass and hand it over to you. But it's gonna, you know, all eyes are going to see this and we want you to feel comfortable with how this is going to be done. And we're here to answer any questions that you've got. Early. Yes, I had just raised my hand because previous uh, breed council meetings with the board, uh, we would go around and introduce ourselves. And um, I don't know if we're gonna do that. Is that a, any, does anyone have an interest in doing that? Jackie? I wasn't sure how that would work on Zoom. Is there a way we can do that, Daryl? Well, sure, we can just start with uh, uh, Abyssinia and, and then work through the breeds. All right, um, let's start with the A's. Please Abyssinia, introduce yourself. Larry Fry. I'm the new breed council secretary. It's my first go around. Uh, never done this before and it's interesting. Um, American short hair, <laughs> trying to remember the standards in alphabetical order. 
American short hair, Carol Johnson. I'm pleased to be here and once again, and um, I'm looking forward to working with everyone. American Bob, or wire hair. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through the short hairs first. I can't remember it in order with both of them. <laughs> is, okay, American wire hair is not here. Um, Balinese. Lorna Fremont, Balinese Breed Council Secretary. Bombay. <laughs> Bombay, Jerry Zatoli, present accounted for. Burmese. <laughs> Art Grafman's uh, for Burmese. Chartreux. Uh, Orca Starbuck Chartreux. But I think Bermilla should come before me. Oops. Uh, okay, I know I was doing something. Bermilla. <laughs> oh, that's okay, Jackie. I'm sorry. <laughs> Stephanie Moore, uh, Bermilla. Uh, okay, let's see. After Chartreux would be C. Oh, color point short hairs. Catherine Brady, I'm here. Go ahead. You missed the American girl. I'm sorry. Well, I was going to do the long hairs next. Oh, oh I'm sorry. <laughs> I've got it right here in the stage. Oh, hey, listen, let, let Al, Aline's got the list here. Let, okay, let Aline, can you do it, please? You're better than my memory. Okay, so we did Abyssinian. How about American Bobtail? Okay. Uh, uh, did, did we mention American Curl? No. Okay. Michael Bull is here, though. I saw him. Michael, can you unmute your microphone? Okay, well, he is here. Uh, American short hair, well, that was Carol Johnson. I think Carol already spoke. She did. American wire hair. They weren't here. They were here. Balinese. Balinese. No. Okay, Bengal. No. Hi, I'm Sam Kerr, and I'm here from the Bengals. Sorry, Sammy. <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> Bourbon. Anybody for the bourbon? Oh, Karen Lane signed in. Yes. Yeah. Karen's here right now. Yes. Okay. Thank you, okay. Karen. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. Good. Uh, I, I think Bombay was already mentioned. Yeah. All right. Pretty short hair. Cindy Bird is here. Cindy is. Cindy Bird, pretty short hair. Breed Council Secretary. For me. <laughs> That's Art Craftsman. He was here. I know he's here. Um, I believe Bermilla was already mentioned. Yep. Okay, sure, true. That was mentioned. All right. Yeah, Orca. And here. we had color point short hair. I believe that was mentioned. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, I think, Catherine Brady. Yes, I'm here. Okay. Thank you, Catherine. Cornish Rex. Nobody for Cornish Rex? No. Uh, Devin Rex. Hi, everyone. Linda Peterson. Uh, Egyptian Mal. Melanie Morgan, Egyptian Mal. European Burmese. Exotic. Okay. Havana Brown. Japanese bobtail. Marianne sent an um, email saying that she could see the Zoom but couldn't get audio, so she's watching on um, Facebook. Okay. Uh, Japanese, well, which is the Balinese, never mind. Kalmani. <laughs> Hello. Uh, Take your name, Frederick. I, I'm Frederick Goodet, uh, and I'm uh, I am in touch with you all from here in in Europe. Hello, Frederick. Hello, hello, Jackie. Hello, Dara. Good to see you. The Karat. Cheryl Coleman here. Laperm. Uh, Dennis Cano is here. 
Lycoy. Mm, that would be Desiree. She's not here. Uh, Maine Coon Cat. Hi, Bethany Cool. I'm here. Manx. Hi, everyone. Joy Day, representing the Manx. Hi. Norwegian Forest Cat. I'm Brooke Cole, and I'm new to the Breed Council, so I'm looking forward to learning and seeing what you all do, and um, I'm here. Thank you. The Austin Cat. Oriental. Son, Sonia is here. She's got no mic. Dottie Olson is here. Um, Persian. Bruce Altschul, Persian. Ragamuffin. Hi, Laura Gregory here. Ragdoll. Hi, this is Isabel Bellavas Ragdolls. Russian Blue. Hi, this is Annette Wilson, Russian Blues. Scottish Fold. Hi, Mary Lee Griswold, Scottish Folds. Selkirk Rex. Hello, everyone. This is Laura Barber, Selkirk Rex. Siamese. Siberian. Singapore. Oh, I, I'm here. I heard saying Siberian, sorry. Uh, nobody here for the Siberian. No, I, I oh, I, I'm sorry, Somali. Somali, Charlene Monroe. Sphinx. Tonkinese. Uh, Turkish Angora. And Turkish Van. Linda Gorsuch, Turkish Van. Did, did you do Oriental? Uh, I think I thought I said Oriental. Is there anybody here for the Oriental? Yeah, Dottie is here. Okay. Yes. Yes, I said hi. Oh, you did. Okay, I, I missed you, Dottie. I saw you there. And didn't hear didn't hear you called. Okay. All right. It is so exciting to see so many of you join us in this virtual way. Thank you so much because I know it's very late for some of you. Um so we have more than 10 breeds. This is amazing. So we'll be able to do wave one and wave two of our, uh, of our project. Um, with the board's permission, I'd like to go out of order because we have one breed council secretary who it is her birthday and she's got a birthday dinner. So if everybody would okay, I'd like to move Iris Zinc all other business up to the second slot. Is that okay? Works for me. Yep. Looks like everybody's shaking their head yes. Iris? Uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, happy birthday, Iris. Thank you. Uh, I really appreciate it. I tried to change the reservation, but it just wasn't possible. Um, the Siberians have a somewhat unique, but not entirely unprecedented color registration issue. And it's gonna be coming down the pike this year and I wanna be prepared to address it correctly. There's a color overseas that is permitted by our standard because we have one of those standards where everything not specifically excluded is permitted and this color is not excluded. It's also been recently investigated by a team of geneticists, including Dr. Le Leslie Lyons. It's been found to be unique to the Siberian breed. The study referred to it as bimetallic or sunshine silver. And these cats express both golden and silver at the same time. They're unusual, they're very striking. And because this color does not exist in any other breed, it is not in the CFA computer. I've been in contact with two breeders who would like to register biometallic cats that are registered in other associations, and I'm sure there are more out there. Although there is no standard related reason why we can't accept them, I've been told that we have to register them as shaded silvers because bimetallic is not in the computer. So my question is, what would it take to get bimetallic into the computer and how can I get it to happen? This is Larry Fry. I'm not sure what the exact uh, procedure is, but I thought that the Breed Council had to have a vote on any change 
and it had to be once the grade council had voted that it went to the board. But this isn't Larry, a change to the standard. Siberians accept all colors with no restrictions. So it would be, a, it, that's not an issue, but the color description itself doesn't exist in the CFA computer is her issue. So okay. Daryl, would it be James, who, who do we talk to about getting that class added? How do we do that? Uh, Aline will respond to that. Okay. Um, yes, just get in contact with James Simbro or myself. And when you're talking about adding a class, you're not talking about adding a color class. That's different. No. You're talking about just no, because we are all one color class at this BC, point. Okay, a BCS code or an actual for, to register them is all you're looking for. Yes. Okay. Yep. You oh. just contact James or myself. Well, actually, actually, it says all accepted colors as defined in the show standards and any other Siberian color, so that we cover it. Yeah, it excludes chocolate and lilac, Daryl, but this is not chocolate or lilac. Yeah, yeah, I understand. I, I, I've read about bimetallics before, so it's uh, there's a good description of it on the Messy Beast. Really looking forward to seeing them. That's, that's gonna be neat. <laughs> I got pictures, anybody who wants to see pictures. Um, well, Iris, are you okay with that answer? I am. Absolutely fine with that answer. Uh, my other agenda item, if I can grab, hold on to the microphone while I have it, is that um, I'd like to make all the Reed Council secretaries aware of something. I'm putting on my other hat as chair of the virtual cat competition committee. And I just want you to know that virtual competitions are not only sponsored by clubs or regions. We've had two that were sponsored by Bree Council secretaries in the name of the Bree Council. And we have a third coming up that uh, I am sponsoring in the name of the Siberian Bree Council. And it can be a great way to raise money for a breed rescue fund, for awards for your breed's top cats, to fund design of a breed council webpage, anything else that a breed council might need money for. And you can also have a breed specialty ring and have cats from all over the world enter, which is a great way to showcase your breed and promote in-depth competition. So if anyone is intrigued by this idea, I'd be delighted to talk to you about what's involved and how my committee can help. Just email me. And that's it. Okay. Um, Daryl, I can actually see the hands now. Do you want me to start yes, calling them? Yes, if you, if you can see them, uh, it's, your, it's your meeting. Okay, thank you. Um, Dennis Cano, you're recognized. Uh, thanks, Jackie. In, uh, in light of the advice for Iris on the bimetallic color, there is a pattern that appears in La Perm's pretty much exclusively the Karpaki pattern. And I wondered if, if the same procedure would apply to a pattern as a color. What does your standard say? It doesn't say anything about it. Uh, I would probably need to adjust the standard to uh, account for the pattern first, right? Yes. Okay, we'll do that first. Um, Isabel? Hi, my question was for Iris. I was wondering if this bimetallic color had been, uh, the genetics and the inheritance pattern had been determined yet by Leslie Lyons or whoever else. I can send you a copy of the article, Isabel. I'd be curious, thank you. Could you send a copy to me too, please? Certainly. Could you send it to the whole Breed Council Secretary group list? I think there's okay. more who would be interested and the pictures. I've had lots of requests for the pictures. <laughs> okay. Um, Marilee? Oop, I was just going to say, yes, I have read that paper and it is fascinating. They have found the genetics for it and the pictures are beautiful. That's very exciting. Okay, I don't see anybody else's hands up. Are we ready to move to the second agenda item? And Iris, happy, happy birthday and have a great dinner. Thank you. So the second agenda item that I'd like to bring up, some of you may be aware that there was a little bit of concern during our Breed Council Committee's first attempt at ballots on affected breeds. Um, we were new and uh, 
saying a little bit would be like suggesting that a forest fire is good for roasting marshmallows. So the Breed Inc. Standards Committee worked very hard together to come up with a flow chart, which we would like you guys to look at. We think that we would like to have this on the CFA website on coming up with proposals. And we want, and this would then give guidance both to ourselves, to all Breed Council secretaries, and to future committees and secretaries on determining whether or not a breed is affected by a standard item. So you'll see it up on the screen. I'd like to talk you through it. You know, we, we start with a proposal to modify a breed standard as desired. The first thing, of course, is the breed council member needs to talk to the breed council secretary and to talk to their own breed council. If there's, you know, if, you, if you're not going to get support then from your own breed council, obviously, it should stop right there, but that's the first thing. And then our first question is, does it impact another breed? If the answer is clearly yes, if you know it impacts, uh, I'm, can we make it a little larger, Elaine, possibly? Mm, okay, we should try. I mean, I, I, for, for those who are asking, I have sent it to the Breed Council Secretary's list and I will send it again if you'd like. Does that make it better? I think it's bigger, yeah. Okay, so we went through a series of questions which we thought would help people. And you'll notice that if at any time you're not sure, it's gonna go on that breed council. <laughs> um, does it impact and you're not sure? So the first one is, is does it directly impact the offspring of a breed? And we gave an example. If, an Ab if the Abbey Breed Council wants to accept new colors, which are not accepted by the Somalis, but the Somalis are allowed to use the offspring of Abyssinians, Somalis would be an effective breed. We're not saying Abbeys want to do that. These are just examples. So anybody whose example breed is on here, please realize I wasn't assuming you wanted to do something like that. If it will affect the offspring of another breed, it affects that breed. The next one, could the offspring within your breed be considered a lookalike for another breed? For instance, if the Abbey Breed Council decided they wanted to show, uh, okay, we, we, we can certainly work on, on language and synonyms, Catherine, um, but yes, if, if the Abbey Breed Council said, we wanna show long hair Abyssinians, that would affect the Somalis that would need to go to their breed council. The third one, which would automatically affect another breed is, are you asking another breed to utilize as an outcross? That obviously affects another breed. If you're asking to utilize them as an outcross, they should have a, have a say in the issue. The fourth one is kind of my catch-all. Are you still in doubt as to whether or not another breed can be affected? If you have any doubt, let's assume they're affected. And then the fifth question is, does your Breeds and Standard Committee liaison have any doubt? You may be absolutely sure, but if the member of the Breeds and Standards Committee who is helping you, we do have a very large committee that has a lot of people doing a lot of work, then we're gonna put it down as an affected breed. And we're hoping this flow chart, and again, this is a draft, will prevent the shall we say, excitement that we had last year. Are there any questions or comments on this? I'm not seeing any hands up. Carol Johnson has her hand up. Okay, Carol Johnson, you're recognized? Yeah, um, American Short Hairs. Um, I'd like this chart, and I can see you put a lot of time into it, However, I would prefer that you defined any allowable outcrest as automatically an infected breed, because I think that's where some of the difficulty came in, is um, that the interpretation, was, the interpretation was that that it was not affected, but our interpretation is not necessarily. Well, Carol, we actually did think about that and we discussed that. Um, 
So here were some examples that we decided that that wouldn't work. The Ossicats have an outcross of the Abyssinian. That, so by, by what you just said, every Ossicat ballot item would have to be considering the Abyssinian affected. And so if the Ossicats wanted to change a color name, that doesn't affect the Abyssinians. The Sphinx used Devon Rex as an outcross. Uh, unless they're accepting hurried, furly, furried Sphinx, that doesn't affect Dev Devon Rex. So it wasn't simply as cut and dried as if there's an outcross, it's automatically an affected breed. So that's but why we did not put that on there. And I'm not saying necessarily that it's an affected breed, but the Devon Rex, when they have changed colors, have contacted American Shorthairs. So, and, and no, it wasn't affected. <laughs> and, and that's pretty much what I had said and my predecessor had said, that we didn't consider it effective. It, it's, it's not necessarily, a, a, it, it shouldn't necessarily be some kind of a thing to get permission. What we're talking about though, is that, that we're talking about communication with a partner that allows the breed to as, a, as an allowable off-cross. And that's where I'm coming from, is that, is that this is a way to improve communications between your partners and between other breed councils members. It, it's an interesting perspective. Do we have, um, Lorna, your hand is up. So can you recognized? Thank you. I'm just curious um, in this exercise. So if per se, the Abyssinian was to put a different color in and the Somali did not, would the Somali then have the power to veto the Abyssinian's acceptance of that color? Or what would be the purpose of asking them as an affected breed? what the ramifications would be. So realize that affected breed ballot items are just getting your point of view. Um, the Somalis can't stop the Abyssinians from doing anything or vice versa. It's just an informational tactic. Um, uh, Larry, to raise your hand, go to reactions and click raise your hand. Um, so it's, it's just a poll, it's, it's an opinion to get their point of view. Um, Art Graf, Lorna, did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Art, you're recognized? Yeah, um, I would really like to get some clarity as to um, what it means to be affected. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, a number of years ago, the, the American Burmese attempted to use European Burmese as an outcross. And we tried to communicate with the European Burmese people. Um, all we ever got out of them was no, or no with, with rather, uh, with a lot of adjectives. Um, there, is, there is a deep rooted hatred between Euro Burms and American Burmese. And what frustrated me and, and my breeders was the fact that we never got any justification for why they were affected. I mean, they just, they refused to communicate with us. And um, given some things that we've discovered about European Burmese, I'm thrilled that we didn't get to use them. But um, it, it seems to me like if, if a breed is going to proclaim that they're affected, that they need to provide some support for that. In the description or in the question that you just put, based on this flowchart, the European Burmese would be considered affected because you're asking them to use them as an outcross. Remember that the item on the affected breed is a poll for opinion. It is the board that takes those answers into consideration. So if the Burmese wanted to use the European Burmese as an outcross, and by this flowchart, they would be affected. And the European Burmese said, no, nah, we really don't like that but all the Burmese people said, yeah, we wanna do that. It would still be the board to decide which way it went. The right. European Burmese cannot 
say what you do with it, but they do have the right to give their opinion about an outcross. Right, and the board flat out refused us the outcross. Um, I think it had at least something to do with the fact that one of the board members is a Euro Berm uh, reader. So, anyways, uh, I'm not sure if that completely answers my question, but I'll I'll let it go. No. Well, the purpose of this flow chart, flow chart, or or whatever version we come up with it, and we we're grateful for your input, is exactly that to give very clear guidance as to whether or not a ballot item should be on another breed council's ballot. Um, Larry, do you, do you, you're recognized? Thank you. <clears throat> I'm still a little bit nonplussed about this uh, outcross business. In the Abyssinians, we have no uh, outcrosses permitted, mm -hmm. uh, but we do affect at least two other breeds that I know of, uh, mm -hmm. including the Smiles. So, what we do in Abyssinian breed, uh, as long as we have the box that says no outcrosses, it really doesn't. I don't see anything on the right hand side under yes or unsure that would really affect our breed. Is that the way that you understand that to be? No. So this is for the breed that is proposing. This is the person who's writing the ballot. So if, for, for instance, the Abyssinian decided somewhere, let, let's say you said, I want to recognize lilac Abyssinians. No, I'm not suggesting you do. Let, let's just, as an example, I want to recognize lilac Abyssinians. Well, the Somalis do use the Abyssinian as an outcross. So therefore, in that case, Somalis should have an advisory thing on there because they then run the risk of getting lilac offspring. So if you were to decide the silvers, let's say you said, I want silver Abyssinians, then a poll should go on the Somali list and theoretically the Ossicat list, because we also use you as an outcross, although we already have silvers. Um, so, but, but these are, remember, these are just polls. Affected breed valid items are polls of the affected breed. It doesn't deny the breed. It becomes the board's responsibility to make the decision once the, the ballots are done. Okay, but you're saying that we would have to have a ballot that would permit the uh, uh, different, uh, other than the four accepted colors. Well, yes, of course you would. Okay, so if we never, if we don't change it, then we can never affect the other ballot, the other breeds. Exactly. I mean, if you make no changes well, to your saying, standard, you would never have to do that. So. Okay, we're violent. We're in violent agreement then. <laughs> um, let me get back to participants. Sorry, I closed my window. Um, Tech Teresa Kiger, you're recognized. Sorry about that. Um, what I'm visual. Maybe one way to visualize this is like a two-way stream or a one-way stream, depending on which way the genes are flowing. Like the case that we're using with the Abyssinian and the um, Ossicat, it's really just a one-way flow. The Abyssinian flows to the Ossicat. You don't flow back to the Abyssinian, in which case it's there's, a, it, there's only one. If you change anything with the Ossicat, you don't need to change uh, of, sorry, you don't need to uh, consult or poll the Abyssinians because it doesn't flow, the stream doesn't flow that way. Right, and, and that was, that, that also, Carol, is an example in your case. So let's say that, um, I think the Devon Rex uses you as an outcross. And yes, they can always go beyond this and impact them, but Devon Rex never come back to American short hair. So unless it would be the lookalike clause, then Devon Rex wouldn't necessarily have to pull the American short hair the way this is done. Um, Carol, your hand is still up. Do you want to comment? Yeah, and I and I understand that the problem that I have with this is that 
you have a particular interpretation of what you feel is impact. The next person that takes your place may have a completely different interpretation of what's infected. If you change it around to ask a question, is your breed used for another breed or is an allowable outcross and allow it to go both upstream and downstream, it will make it more specific and less, less subject to somebody's interpretation in the, in the future. My understanding was, and this goes way, way back, was that Scottish folds would always have folded ears. In fact, there were breed council, council secretaries that discussed that when allowing Scottish folds to use that as an allowable outcross. Then the, then the rules changed and it was more of a surprise because it, even when we polled it, but I pulled, did an informal poll on my breed council, they would have approved it, but almost everybody felt that we were an affected breed. And some of that has to do with history because that's the way it was interpreted quite a while ago. So as I said, I think you could simplify it by just asking, is your breed used as an allowable outcross or you know, what allowable outcrosses to do it, and then it's a rule that everybody understands. You just pull all of allowable out process, both ways. Uh, Marilee, you're recognized. So I, I really don't want to. Um, th this is seems to be um, just about um, this interaction between these two breeds. So I really don't want to make it about these two breeds, but for this particular case. Um, the question of whether or not it, it was a lookalike breed with the American Shorthairs was not up to me. It was up to the board. And that's what the board decided at the time. They could have very easily said that this was a lookalike affected breed. Um, so that was not, that was not a, a breed council um, issue at the time. Um, that was something that the board um, decided. Again, realize that this flow chart is to try to prevent the um, hard feelings and to try to give us some guidance. Um, are there any other breed council secretaries that want to speak to Carol's point? I mean, I, I understand Carol's point, but there are 45 of y'all. So I would love to get some other input as to whether you want it just that simple. If if, we, if a breed uses another breed of an outcross, regardless of what's going on their ballot, they must do a poll to the other one, which I believe is what Carol is saying, up and down. So no matter if an Ossicat, if the Ossicat breed standard wants to change, they must consult with the Abyssinians. If the color points want to do something, they must consult with the Siamese, Devon Rex, things, et cetera. Um, can, can I get some other points of view on, on from other breeds? Um, okay, Laura Gregory, you're recognized. Okay, so if I'm interpreting this correctly, the ragamuffin has used the Persian, we've mm -hmm. used ragdoll, and we've used Selkirk Rex as our crosses over our years. So yep. if we were to do this, any type of change, I mean, if we do a color change, anything we would do, we'd have to pull all three of those breeds for any type of change if that were to be the case. If I were to change, if we were to change this to simply up and down, if, if you have an outcross, then yes. If, if that's what we change it to. The way it okay. is now, no. Because that just seems, I mean, I think we have to think about some of these breeds that have been used tremendously for everything. That's an awful lot to ask for even small little things to pull for every breed and a breed's history for some of us breeds that come with a lot of breeds in our background. That's just my opinion for little things, you know, I think we should look at it, what we're asking. Uh, Charlene Monroe, you're recognized. 
Well, going back to the Abbeys and the Somalis, except backwards, if I wanted to show a short-haired Somali, I think the Abbeys would want to have a say-so about that. Mm -hmm. Certainly. And that would be under the look-alike. Absolutely. Okay. okay. Um, Carissa Oshel. Carissa Oshel, Persians. I think there's no problem with requiring the affected breed councils without crosses to be asked if they want to put it on their poll, but they don't have to. For example, if the ragamuffins want to put on their standard change that they're going to describe their code a different way, and if I don't think it affects the Persians, I can say, no, I'm not going to pull my breed council on that. But if the ragamuffins want to change their standard to a significantly more snub-nosed cat, then yes, I need to pull the breed council. So either way, no matter how my breed council votes, I realize, and everyone needs to realize, it's only advisory to the board. The effective breed council has very little power to stop uh, when you're offspring breeds from changing themselves into mimics. Can I remind everyone to lower your hand once you're finished speaking? Um, so Carissa, are you saying you're in favor of any outcrosses regardless should should send have proof because we had an issue last time where the other breed council did not put an item on their ballot and that caused issues as well i think they should receive notification i don't say it has to be polled but i think the breed council secretary should be respected enough to be given the notification of a possible change and again if the breed council secretary hopefully will have the logic to understand whether or not that would actually affect their breed. It's just, I, I think, it, like Carol was saying, it's a matter of respect and communication and it helps feel, it helps everyone feel like they're always gonna be in the loop. And as she said, you have a certain understanding now, but mm -hmm. you didn't when you came in. And Certainly. so I think this would be a great thing moving forward because other people might be in the position in the future. I'm sure that's why we're trying to do this. Exactly. Um, Laura Gregory, you're, you're recognized. Um, just to respond back to what Carissa said. Now, I think that would probably be a better way to do it, that if the breed council secretary can at least say yay or nay, then I, and I was understanding it as it was absolutely going as a poll. Because if at least as the breed council secretary can look at it and say, oh, that doesn't really affect us. I just was picturing it as a poll going on every single breed always. So that might be a lot easier if we worded it that way. I know some people might get affected by saying, well, that breed council secretary might, but at least that would be a lot easier that way. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna ask for some continuity information on this because I don't, I don't have all the history. Annette, can you give me your point of view on whether it's okay just to talk to the other breed council secretary and we can count that? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, it, it, to me, it's common courtesy. Um, I think that any breed council uh, secretary that has any question at all about whether the other um, breed might feel like they should be asked should just go ahead and ask. But it absolutely doesn't. It, it's it, it's actually up to the the two affected breed council secretaries and the breeds and standards committee to agree on whether or not it's necessary to put it on the, on the ballot or not. Um, there, more often than not, um, if something is proposed on a ballot and we suggest that the, the, uh, another breed council might want to at least be alerted of it, notified of it, most of the time they're like, that's fine, we don't care. Or I'll, I'll informally pull my breed council members, but I don't think they'll care. And, and it goes like that. So I, I think, I think you, you, you've got a good outline here. I think I understand Carol Johnson's viewpoint and how things could get missed, but but this is a learning process for everybody. So mm -hmm. this is something actually to consider going over uh, every year with new breed council secretaries. So there's an understanding of how important it is to communicate with each other. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Art Grafman. Yeah, to kind of come back to what I was I'll call it complaining about before it. One issue that I have is that it, it's just far too easy 
for a breed to just proclaim that they're affected. It seems to me that they really need to provide some support for why they're affected. Um, kind of like to see that put into policy. Okay. Um, Carol, you still have your hand up. Would you like to talk again? Yeah, I, I actually had it down and put it back up again. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I, I'm not saying that there needs to be an official poll, poll, nor am I saying that if Persians were used 20 years ago to make a breed that you, and, but are no longer an active breed um, outcross, that you need to pull them. I mean, what I'm what I'm saying is, a, is talk to the person, and a, and a lot of times we never pulled the the breed council on the Devon Rex changes. It was pretty much we decided that wasn't necessary. If this is made, if if the purpose of your flow chart is to increase communication yeah. between people, then then communicate both ways is all I'm saying, is that just, just communicate both ways. And as, as everybody says, is that at the end of the day, the, the board is gonna decide if you're affected or not. And, and as Clarissa says, that it, there's only so much that we're gonna be able to do anyway, but it's common courtesy. Let's, let's go ahead and get something that's easy for people to understand. An outcross is going to be, is an easy concept for people to say, let's check this box and be done with it. Anyway, my two cents were. Appreciate that. Teresa? What I'm hearing from this discussion we're trying to achieve a couple of things. One, this is this um, flowchart is really meant for the current, not just the current breed council secretaries, but uh, to give a path to show a path for breed council secretaries in the future. And what I'm hearing is it's good to keep the line of communications open. What I might suggest um, as far as a revision on this is under the diamond that says, does the proposal directly impact another CFA breed? Under uns then unsure, and then does the proposal indirectly impact or affect another breed? And then say informally uh, communicate with the affected breed, the possible affected breeds breed council secretary via email or phone and then to, yep. and to determine if it is indeed an affected breed and then those two can make that decision yay or nay that would be very easy to do uh, it yeah it's easy to do and that as carol was saying and several of our other breed council secretaries it gives uh it models that behavior of saying hey let's let's talk about this first and see where we are. Um, Karen? Yeah, you that's a great idea. The, the concern I have, Teresa, is that is, is exactly what Art brought up. What is an affected breed? That can be open to interpretation for anything. If American short hairs change to a different color or a different pattern, does that really affect Somalis, for example? And, you know, so it, it, today, I don't think anybody here would think that it does. Tomorrow, I'm not as sure about. And all I was saying that if you, if you define an affected breed as one that you either allow for an, out, an outcross or one that that comes into your breed as an outcross, that's specific. And that's something that won't change because it's specifically defined. But affected versus unfected is pretty, is kind of a vague term. Um, Isabel has a comment in the chat. Isabel, would you like to speak? Well, I was, uh, I appreciate the, um, 
the notice uh, to the um, other affected breeds, but if it's just an informal uh, conversation or email and an informal poll is made, uh, my concern would be that it's just like two people talking to each other. There's no actual record of it. Um, I don't know, I would, I would have concerns about that if, you know, at least I, I guess I see on your flow chart that you actually have um, an indication that it should be um, noted whether or not the other, the affected breed or an affected breed was notified. So, you know, at least that kind of covers. Yeah, and, and that's why I put that there so that we would have a record that the consultation was made. Okay. Um, Lorna? What if we, um, as breed council secretaries were to send um, any and all proposals to the breed council secretaries list so that we can all look at them and, um, we can determine if our breeds are affected by those proposals or not. Um, it would also help us, um, you know, have another pair of eyes on the proposals from our fellow breed council secretaries. We did have a discussion about that. And while I think we can ask people to do it and people can certainly, can certainly volunteer to do it, the question was brought up as to can we require them to do it? And I'm not sure we can do that. Um, are there thoughts on that conversation, on that point? Yeah, I keep trying to raise my hand, but I can't get it to work. Sorry, go ahead, Larry. <laughs> okay, I guess my question is, what is the ultimate end game of this flow chart that we see here? Is it to document that the breed council secretaries have talked with each other about any proposed changes, or is it to present evidentiary documentation to the board that we want to make this change. Um, the purpose of this yeah. communications. The purpose of this flowchart is to provide a tool on the CFA website for breed council secretaries, breeds and standards committees, and future breed council secretaries to prevent the kind of confusion that we had this year so that they would have some sort of guidance to help them um, with determining whether or not something was an affected breed. And because quite honestly, you know, I'm, I'm a quality manager, it's what I do. I wanted to make sure we had evidence of that consideration included in the rationale just for the records going forward so that somebody couldn't claim you didn't consider this or, or to go back and second guess because we, we, we got a lot of hard feelings um, this year. And, and that's my fault and the committee's fault we were new um, and, and things came up and it was, again, there were differences of opinion. There are still differences of opinion. So what we're trying to do here is do exactly what Carol is asking and what Art is asking. Mm -hmm. We want to define at least via process what an affected breed would be. And it could so, be as simple you, as Carol has proposed that you know we have these questions, but at the very top one, potential, are you an outcross to anybody? And then you add in your rationale that we talked about it. It's not. Um, right, so this is basically a formalization of a procedure. Yes. That you would like to see followed. Yes. To make sure that people are talking to each other and we have some objective evidence of it. Jackie. Yes. You might want to limit uh, your discussion. Uh, I don't know how much more you have on your agenda. Uh, um, you know, we got a little over half an hour uh, left oh. for the meeting, and uh, uh, I, I don't want to cut you short, but you know, uh, you may uh, have uh, some input from the board uh, on some of this stuff too. So, um, yeah, absolutely. So, um, if it's okay, we'll take Art Grathman. He's got his hand up, and and then we will um, table discussion on this and continue it on the list if that's all right. Unless there's somebody else who has their hand up and I'm missing it. Art? Yes. Um, you know, getting on the phone and talking to somebody, I think, is a great way to go um, as a first step. And it's really simple enough to, when you're done with your conversation, to shoot an email back to that other breed council secretary saying, this is what I understood we agreed upon, and copy the chairs with that so it does become a, a form of a record of that discussion mm -hmm. that was had. Um, that all seems simple enough to do. 
Right. And, and that's what's in this with that. We just add that statement into the rationale that, hey, we had the conversation and we determined it was or it wasn't. Um, if there are no other people uh, who want to talk on this, we can go to the next agenda item, if that's all right. Um, the next agenda item was brought uh, to me by our new board member. Aline, could you scroll up, please? Our new old board member, our old new board member? I'm not sure. Um, Mark Hannon. Uh, we know that we have breed web pages for each of our breeds, and some of them have woefully out of date information. Um, and again, the CFA website is our face to the public. So we wanted to discuss the Breed Council Secretary's reviewing their breed information page and updating that text. Is there any discussion on this? Does anyone have um, a comment on this? Um, Art, your hands up. Okay, Art, your hands down. <laughs> well, yeah, um, just quickly, I don't have I don't have any trouble doing it at all. It's just uh, maybe that's just something that chairs need to remind us to do. Um, Carol Johnson. Yeah, I think in the past, um, people have asked me to do that. So um, I'm glad to do it. And if this is a great forum to, to do it, we will be glad to do it. But I, I didn't know that, that that was something we volunteer to do. Usually people would ask, so. Okay, well, I'm, I'm, I'm asking, um, Teresa Kiger. Good case in point, I get uh, contacted uh, at, for, I get contacted by the media asking about this breed or breeds that are this. I talk to them and then say, go and look at CFA's brief, uh, the page on the breed. So yeah, this, these pages are being quoted and referenced. So it's, it's really important that the pages look accurate and up to date so that your breed looks good and CFA looks good. Um, Ann Mathis. Um, as a member of the um, education committee, these breed proposals are also used to train our associates overseas and for workshops in this country. And then being updated is very helpful to people going into the judging program, people attending the BAOSs. I know that there was a request sent out from central office, I don't remember who sent it, that requested those be updated. Um, but it's so helpful if they are, if they're current. Um, and if anybody wants guidance on how to improve theirs, arts is absolutely the best. Um, <laughs> and he'll show one picture of a cat and he'll say this is positive and this is not quite so good. And that's good to see instead of some of the breeds that are beautifully done, except they never point out a negative about a cat. They'll, they'll only say everything about this cat is wonderful and every cat has a fault. So okay, it, we're, we're talking about the web pages, not the, the PowerPoints. Okay. Um, uh, uh, Brooke. Norwegian Forest Cat. I'll just share that James sent me the password for the Norwegian Forest Cat website. And I met with our group and we've got some ideas of things we're going to do along with the breed presentations. But um, I have, it was nice to get that password information and we are going to be working on that immediately. So thank you so much. Um, Annette? Uh, yes, I, I think we're still confused. The, the breeds website, a breed website is different. Um, than the breed uh, web page on CFA, and of course, different from the breed presentation in PowerPoint. So I think we need to first figure out what is it that needs to be updated, and if it is in fact the CFA web page that gives the little, um, you know, summary that often previous breed council secretaries or current ones wrote, can we get that in some type of format to each of the breed council secretaries so that they can make the changes? Um, we, we can't just go in and start typing on a CFA no, web page. I, I wasn't suggesting that the Breed Council secretaries type it. I was suggesting that the Breed Council secretaries come up with wording and, and review it. But yes, we are talking about the CFA Breed web pages, the information pages. That's what was brought up by Mark Cannon. 
Um, and that's what we're looking to do. And I'm sure we can get the wording, but each breed council secretary can also just see the wording on their on the web page. Um, right. Uh, okay, um, Isabel. Yeah, I, I, I saw a couple of other people had the same question I did. Uh, we were wondering what web page you wanted updated, if it was the CFA one or if it's the breed council one, because not all the breed councils have their own web page. I know we don't have one right now. No, this is specifically the breed web page on the CFA.org website. Um, Lynn? Okay, that answers it because there's a link on the um, CFA web page that goes to an outside breed um, web page and it's so outdated and I tried to fix it. I got the, the passcode from Jeannie and it's HTML, which I had no idea. So I just wanted to clarify that, um, sorry, the dog, that um, the one on CFA is updated and fine, but the outside links could are, could be very confusing to people because people are clicking on them. And I, I honestly just don't know how to deal with that. I'm not that techie. So um, I don't at know. This point we're, yeah, at this point, we're just talking about the CFA page under control of CFA that has okay. the read description. So maybe you can get those links off or something so we, so we don't even have to, you know, so they don't even have we, to link. And that would be something you as Breed Council Secretary could do, say, remove this link. I think I did. I'll try again. Thank you. Okay. Well, no, but I mean, we'll do it as a project. Uh, Teresa. So what I'm suggesting, and Annette, this is uh, going to answer the question that you've got. The easiest way to do this, go to the breed page on the CFA website, copy the text, paste it into a Word document, make a copy of that, start changing your editing there. If you need help, contact Jackie or myself or any other council member. And that way you'll get the change that, that you need. And you can make the changes yourself. Once you're happy with it, we'll pass it on to Kathy Durdick to, to make those changes because as webmaster, she would be the one to be making those anyway. Dennis? Um, I hate to ask this, but there are so many links and breed profiles and different sites. Um, it would probably behoove the Breeds and Standards Committee to have actually a list of the URLs that are needing change and publishing that maybe to the secretary's list so that we're not out changing something that doesn't need to be touched yet. Uh, I know I would probably go after all of the little perm ones and maybe or maybe not get the right one. Uh, so somehow we need to track which ones we're changing uh, so that we get the right uh, effort done as efficiently as possible. Thank you. Is that possible Jackie. to do? Yes, Carol. Jackie, Aline wants to say something. Aline? <laughs> Um, yeah, I just want to let everybody know that we are, um, our, one of our priorities this year at the marketing uh, committee is to revamp the website. And the brief pages are the biggest thing, the biggest priority. They're going to be uh, completely changed with Brie Council Secretary's input. We want to bring consistency to the format, consistency, consistency to the writing. Um, we want to make these pages more appealing to the general public, you know, so they really are interested in the breed. So uh, I would recommend that uh, breed council secretaries hold off on trying to rewrite what's already there because it, they all may change very dramatically. And, and I just don't want to see you waste your time doing something that may only be available for, <clears throat> excuse me, three or four months. So why don't we table this discussion till after ballot items anyway, if, if that works. Um, Melanie, you had your hand up. I apologize. Uh, well, if we're tabling it, uh, it's irrelevant. However, um, in the past, we've worked on projects like this, I, I believe, and Breeds and Standards took the lead. I, I think, Aline, you can um, correct me if I'm wrong, we have Word copies or PDFs of these, I think Word documents. And what we did was we sent copies of 
each of the individual breed things to the breed council secretaries, ask them to review and make any changes. And that allowed breeds and standards to maintain a semblance of control and um, accountability as they could check them off rather than just having people go off on their own and things getting lost in the in the shuffle. But um, I, I applaud the, um, the movement to standardize and uniform, make things uniform that Elaine's talking about as we start to reform and, and, um, and refine our, our CFA image and branding out there. So um, I'm fully in support of tabling it until we can get it put together in a cohesive project. Um, the, the last item before all other business was uh, from Aline Tartaglia. We wanted an understanding from you, the Breed Council Secretaries, on the usefulness and utilization of the CATS, the Ancestry Tracking System Program. Does anyone have any feedback or comments on that? Or Aline, would you like to discuss it? Um, Brooke, your hand is up. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a new share. Um, okay. My guess is a lot of people don't know what CATS is, the CATS Ancestral Tracking Service. It's something that we've um, had available I think it's been 25 or so years, and I've, <clears throat> excuse me, put the information up on the screen um, for those who aren't familiar with it. And just, I think the first paragraph sums it up. Uh, it's a program which allows cats that don't meet CFA's requirements for standard registration to be recorded to CFA for the purpose of establishing a line of breeding. The system is suitable for cats and new breeds for cats and CFA's recognized breeds when it's not possible to meet the usual requirements for registration. For instance, submission of a certified pedigree. It, the, the, the system is hardly used anymore. It's misunderstood. Um, cats that are recorded in cats rarely ever move over to CFA's regular registration system because they, they don't have the pedigree necessary. Um, we just had an instance a week or two ago where someone recorded five generations of what she considered Persians in cats. We don't, it's not something we monitor. It's not even a, a main program in our, our regular database. And then she thought that she would now be able to take offspring from that has the four generations behind it and register them as Persians. These are not Persians in the background. They're you know, they're, there's no pedigrees from any other association. She just basically took a cat that she said, oh, it's a Persian, let me register it as a Persian in cats. Now I've done this for four generations. I can register the kittens that are produced. So it, it's misunderstood. Um, we're not sure there's even a purpose for it in today's day and age. So we just wanted to get some feedback. If you think that we should continue with it and if there is a purpose. Uh, Pam Delabar. I thought I should comment since I'm one of the major authors of this program. Um, this started actually in 2003, 2004 is when this was written. And it was after Wayne Harding and I went to Shanghai to judge in China for the first ever cat show in China. Um, we found several Sorry, cats. I'm still not sure about that. I don't know who's got Siri on, I don't. Um, one can't know everything, can one? <laughs> it's my watch, Jesus, <laughs> sorry. Um, <laughs> the, um, I can't believe it was my watch. Anyway, we found several cats that had been pure, procured from essentially Russia, Kazakhstan, that had no pedigrees, but were obviously of an identifiable breed type. Um, we wrote up the program that you see as, as you uh, on the board there. And uh, at that time, two uh, all breed judges could review these cats, submit paperwork to CFA to get them uh, started to develop pedigrees. Uh, Becky Orlando and I did some 21 in uh, Taiwan alone. 
where this comes uh, up to uh, the current times is that we're seeing in various associations, various of the major associations here in Europe are breeds that are going to, like we did with the Havana Brown, to enlarge their gene pool. They're doing the same thing over here in Europe. And specifically, I have a, a, a friend in another association that, that had, uh, is doing what they call an experimental breeding with um, Bermans to enlarge their gene pool because of different health factors that are being found in, in Bermans um, for certain in, in uh, Europe. Uh, these cats can ultimately end up in CFA. Uh, I know Bermans in the past have been um, imported from, from uh, Europe. And with these experimental breeds, even though they may be um, approved by this major association, it shows up on their pedigree and it would stop um, the... Um, uh, registration of that cat within CFA where it may be, let's say, registered with FIFA. For that reason, I think we should keep cats around. It's not, it's not hurting us. Um, I don't know how it would possibly affect, um, I, it's definitely not affecting Norwegians by any stretch of the imagination, um, or Maine Coons, but there are other breeds that we are seeing coming up also with these experimental breedings and, and it's done particularly to enlarge the gene pool for that breed. So for that reason, I, I don't see any reason to get rid of it. it this is a registration matter um, and it, it comes from, from you know, each individual breeder if they wanna take the, the um, opportunity to bring these cats into their programs. Um, and it's it's a by breed thing. So unless anybody's got any questions, you know, there's your background, and that's why we started it, and what's going on today, particularly in Europe. Um, Art Rathman. I would like to apologize in advance if I come off as having a bad attitude. <laughs> Not at all. About 11, 12 years ago, I put in place a policy to import cats from Southeast Asia to help support the genetic diversity of the Burmese breed. Um, there is no such thing as a pure Burmese cat over in that part of the world anymore. Um, they are going to be pointed. They're going to be mink. They're, some of them are going to be solid. Um, so we're going to have some stripes. They're going to. Have, we decided that in order to actually try and get cats that have the best phenotype, that we needed to allow for these other coat patterns. What do you do with these cats when you try to outcross to them? Well, if I start with a pointed cat, my first litter is all going to be mink, best case. So we use the cats registry as a way to record these breedings and to allow us to move forward and do another generation of breedings. And from there, we would be able to uh, pull off some solid Burmese cats. Okay. Um, well, I, I, I put this proposal forward with my breeders and I got a bunch of them carrying on. Oh no, don't do this. Don't make us go and have special registration requirements with CFA because they can't handle it. Oh, come on. I wrote, I wrote the procedures out. The policies were written in a way where you just walk down the policy, you check the boxes. If these things, if it's this, you do this thing. If it's that, you do another thing. It was all written out. I was applauded by the board at the time that this was a great way to go and everything else. And from that, and we got it all approved. And from that day forward, every time somebody needs to have a cat registered that is not going straight into a Burmese with an 0400 uh, series number on it, they can't get these cats registered. 
And when you do a little bit of digging, you find out, well, the cats is a, it's actually just some, you know, a home, you know, a pedigree program that anybody would have at their home. And it's on a PC somewhere and it's hidden under a desk and nobody knows how to turn it on, you know, and then you add the, you know, the Jerry Hemza approach to things, which is if I don't understand how to do something, I just shove it in the bottom of the pile. And it's, you know, and it's literally taking months to get cats registered with this thing. And nobody seems to know what they're doing. And I've gone back to James and said, James, can you set up a wiki for these guys at central office so we can write up a page that walks them through these procedures? Sure, sure. And then it never happens. Um, I understand that there's a lot of problems at CFA in terms of shortage of that resources it's not something that gets done very often so you know you you tackle the big projects and you don't worry about the small ones yada 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 and in the end if if cats is perceived to not be a useful and successful program it's because nobody seems to be able to use it okay um Aileen would like to speak to just respond um, okay, and we only have eight minutes left, so um, uh, Aline, go ahead, and then I I'd like to defer to the board members if the Breed Council Secretary is okay. We have a lot of hands up, but the board hasn't really been able to speak yet. Um, I just wanted to address some of um, Art's concerns. We, we do have cats up and running. We do know where the software is. It is on one PC, granted. It's basically just a pedigree program. Um, and, and we, uh, Shirley Dent is now processing those registrations. Um, it's, it's used by very few people and, and it's, it's fine if people still want to use it. But if at some point you want to take cats out of that um, cats and make them fully see if they register cats, you know, we have to be notified about it because there is no um, automatic transition or anything like that. And again, my concern is that the program CATS is being used um, by people for things that was never intended to be used. When somebody was sending these Persian registrations in, you know, now that Shirley's doing them, she might catch on that it's from the same person. But, you know, we don't check for that sort of thing. So anyway, that's, that's well. what I'm that's one of the reasons why I recommended that that CFA get a wiki set up so that these procedures and these policies can be put in a place where the folks at CFA and I know there's turnover um, can go to look to see how this stuff works and and how it should be applied. Um, you know, again, I, I have I have deep concerns that what happens is because it's not the normal thing that these guys do that they don't know what to do with it they don't know where to go to get answers you know questions answered i've i have had breeders come to me as breed council secretary and and complain that it's been three four months and i still can't get my cat registered and i have to proactively go back to the central office and and get get them off the dime or I mean, it's not even somebody at central office coming to me saying a breeders come to us with this thing and we're not sure what to do about it. It's, I have to go to them. Or if, if, if you, um, this is the last thing I'll say, because I know we don't have much time. If you have a breeder that's coming to you and saying it's taking three or four months for a registration to be done, please contact me because that shouldn't happen. And if it is happening, there could be a very good reason why it's happening. Sometimes there's a delay. We can't get the information. Not that it's never not our fault, but if that happens, please, please come to somebody who can solve it. And we'll certainly do our best to solve that problem for you. Okay. I, I have not been breed council secretary for the last term. So we'll hopefully we can get some of this squared away. Like I said, I apologize if I appear to have a bad attitude about no, it. Not, 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 not at all. It's been um, frustrating. Melanie, you've had your hand up. Can you hear me or did my um, mute? We can hear you now. Are my speakers working? Yes. Okay, good. Um, sorry about that in terms of that. Um, in terms of the CATS ancestral tracking service, which I think was the question we were on um, yes. from central office, 
Um, although I'm not sure it's being actively used at the moment, um, it is useful for those of us who have things like the import policy where cats that come in um, who are from unknown origins are not accepted in their first, second or third generation so that someone needs to track them. And I, we've always um, directed them to the CATS um, program. Whether they use it or not is up to them, but it's nice to have it there as a resource uh, because we do have a three generation requirement before we give a CFA registration number to an import. Um, so I am with Pam Delabar. I think that regardless of whether it's being actively utilized or what, it serves a great purpose. Okay. Pam, you have your hand up? Yes, this is just a tool, but uh, our, I want you to know that the American Burmese is alive and well in several of the European Burmese uh, lines here in, in Europe. And it's been due to a couple of cats that were imported from the US. So it's something you may wanna watch as breed council secretary. With the CATS program, I'm sorry? Somebody's, with the CATS program, the, uh, and that's not my watch, uh, with the CATS program, it works just like if you were importing a cat from another association. If there is, and I saw Sanja said something about the wild cat with the Aussie cat. Whatever five generations that you need for your Aussie cats, um, if by in the sixth generation, there is something that normally you would not uh, allow in your breed, if it falls off that pedigree, it's gonna fall off the pedigree in cats as well and would be eligible to be registered in CFA. So it's our rules for registration are not changed if a cat is in, in the CATS program, it develops the pedigree to where it should be eligible to be registered in CFA's registration program. It's in CATS to develop the pedigree and to develop the number of generations required for registration. Okay, thank you. Do, do we have any other, um, I mean, we're. I don't, I want to be cognizant of everybody's time. Um, would the board like to um, address, I, I apologize for the shortness, this went much longer than I thought these items would take. Do the board have any feedback for the Breed Council Secretaries or the Breeds and Standards Committee? Not at 1.30 in the morning, Jackie. <laughs> So either we've awed you with our brilliance or you're just shaking your heads. I'm not sure which, <laughs> or, or something in between. Melanie? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, and I, I would have actually pre-noticed this, but it didn't really happen until about 10 minutes before the meeting. Uh, after the board meeting yesterday, um, where we had some very interesting discussions with our chair of our scientific advisory committee, um, I actually contacted Roger Brown and had a really um, fascinating conversation with him. Um, he's someone, uh, for those of you who don't know on the uh, Green Council Secretaries, who's worked quite extensively on, on genetics and, and, and the research and some of the DNA testing uh, opportunities that are out there. Um, and I asked him if he would be interested in actually um, putting together a Zoom type seminar slash meeting to go over some of the opportunities that are out there and some of the, um, some of, some of the options, et cetera. And then also discuss, you know, from, you know, as we all know, he's a vet, uh, he's, he's quite well informed on a, a lot of these um, topics. If, um, so he would basically just take us through all of that. And he thought it was a lovely idea. I was wondering, and I thought we would do it for the breed council secretaries who could then share it with their um, breed council members if there was an interest. Um, so I just thought I'd throw that out there because Roger has very generously offered to um, put something together for us. Do we have uh, any, anything else? What has the board got to say? Haven't heard anything from the board. That's what I was just asking. Uh, board members? Daryl? <laughs> I 
Jackie, uh, I've been speaking. <laughs> well, I know, of course you, yes. And, and you, you've been representing the board evidently. <laughs> and I appreciate that. Um, uh, I, I, and I'll, Melanie. And Me Melanie's not technically on, well, yes, she is. I'm sorry. Yes. And Melanie, absolutely. I'm sorry, Melanie. I was thinking of the new elections. Congratulations. <laughs> and Annette's been speaking. Yes. You will be a board member in just a few hours. Exactly. Um, again. Again. Do, do we have anything else? Um, I, I really appreciate it. This was a very talkative meeting. I was very exciting to see all this input. No, I, Jackie, I, I think you and Teresa have done a good job. Um, there was a little stumble out of the gate, but you know what? You uh, maintained your stride and you're finishing across the, the wire. So uh, I'm proud of you guys and I know you'll keep up the good work. I'm really impressed with the, the flow charts and everything you guys come up with makes things uh, very easy to understand. You just follow the flow chart when you get a question and you arrive at your answer. So uh, those are those are really, really great things. Uh, I'm glad that there was uh, such a high turnout of the Brief Council secretaries and uh, you addressed some uh, good uh, questions. So uh, anyway, uh, keep up the good work. Uh, I know you guys will work closely uh, with the Brief Council secretaries and the breeds and central office so that we can get all these things updated and uh, make them current. Yeah, we're gonna have a busy year and thank you for the 18 breeds that volunteered. We've got wave one and wave two. <laughs> I think Larry has would it be possible to have would it be possible to have uh, more meetings like this among the Brig Council secretaries? Uh, sure. I mean, we we've got a, a list. We can we can have impromptu meetings if the Breed Council secretaries want to do them. It doesn't have to be at the annual. I, think was I was just gonna suggest that too. What's that? Not you. Well, Jackie, you and Teresa can schedule meetings exactly. as well with your Breed Council secretaries. It doesn't have to be in conjunction with the, the board. Yes, the Breed Council to you. Okay. Absolutely. Um, Larry, that's a great suggestion. We'll talk about it online and we can have right, maybe quarterly meetings with the committee if you think that would add value. Great. Thank you guys so much. What an awesome meeting. Thank you so much for all your feedback. Fantastic. So we'll adjourn the meeting, Jackie, if that if that's